Before I start, uh, I want to acknowledge my colleagues and students who influenced my thinking on the issues that I'll be talking about today. And NSERC at the bottom here is the Canadian Research Funding Agency that paid for it all. And I want to begin with a disclaimer. Um, this talk is going to have quite a philosophical orientation, but I'm just a computational linguist, not a philosopher, and so the talk is going to be rather naive from a philosophical point of view. But I think that's okay, because all of computational linguistics is like that. Computational linguists are philosophically naive, and in fact, that's going to be one of the points of my talk. So, my talk is going to be about text meaning, with a hyphen between text and meaning, just for added certainty. And to define text meaning, I first need to define the word text for you, although it seems to be rather late in a conference called Text, Speech and Dialogue to be doing that. And in fact, I'm going to define text to include speech and dialogue anyway, so those are just redundant. Now, the key point here, a subtlety of English, I'm using text here as a count noun in English, not as a mass noun. That is, I want to talk about a text, or texts, rather than merely some text. So, by a text, I mean a complete utterance, with the emphasis on complete. Any utterance that's being construed as complete. Although I'm using the word text, as I said, I want to include spoken language as well as written language here. And it could be interactive language. It could be a dialogue, for example. A text has no particular length. It could be short. It could be long. And it could actually be an excerpt from a longer text that, for some reason, we want to construe as complete in itself. For example, we might construe an exchange in a dialogue as being a text in its own right. So when I talk about text hyphen meaning, I'm talking about the complete meaning of that text, its broader message. And that includes the implicatures, the pragmatic and logical inferences, and probably any, and any additional subtext, that is, the meaning between the lines, quote unquote, as we say. Now, that's in contrast to thinking of text as just a bunch of words and looking at the word meanings or looking at the sentence meanings that you can find in the text. Because it includes pragmatic inferences from the text, text meaning might be a whole lot more than the sum of the individual sentences that make up the text. It doesn't have to be, but it certainly could be and usually it will be. On the other hand, Text meaning could also be a whole lot less than the sum of the individual meanings of the text. Uh, that's because a characteristic of long texts is that the earlier parts of the text are there only as support for um, only as support for understanding the later parts of the text, and they're not there as part of the message itself. So a process that just runs through a long text and due to really reports the sentence meaning of each of the sentences in the text have somehow missed a broader point about what the meaning of the text as a whole is. Now, given all this, we can ask, where does text meaning actually come from? That is, what is its locus, the place from which it arises? Now, in philosophy and literary theory, there are three traditional answers to this question. The first is, text meaning comes from the text itself. I mean, duh, the text is the linguistic element, so that's what has the meaning. How could it be any other way? Well, here's two ways it could be differently. The second view is that meaning is that something is something that people make, not texts. Meaning doesn't come from the text, it comes from the writer or the speaker, from the person who wrote it or said it. And in particular, meaning comes from that person's intention. Uh, this view is associated with philosophers, in particular, H.P. Uh, Grice. Now, in this view, text meaning is whatever message it is that the writer or speaker wants to get across, uh, regardless of whether or not the reader or listener is able to figure it out. 
And so the text meaning can be quite different from the literal sentence level meaning. And that's how we get metaphor and indirect politeness and so on. The third view, and this turns up in many different forms, uh, is associated with various postmodernist writers, Stanley Fish and Roland Barthes are two who are well known. This view says, yes, it's people who make meaning all right, but the locus of text meaning is the reader or the listener in this view. And the meaning of a text is um, each reader's individual response to that text and doesn't have to be the same as anybody else's. After all, the only thing the reader can know for certain is their own personal response to the text. And if different readers do tend to agree with one another on what the meaning of a text is, they have the same response to the text, that's in the view of writers like Stanley Fish, simply because they're members of the same so-called interpretive community, and so they respond to a text the same way, more or less, and get the same text meaning. Now, these answers aren't mutually exclusive. We could say that meaning comes from more than one place. We could choose two out of the three as our answer. We could even say, choose all three and say that meaning arises from all of them. But in practice, that's not what philosophers and literary theorists tend to do. They like one neat answer and they should say, choose just one of these three, please. Notice that we can ask exactly the same question about locus of meaning, where does meaning arise, for linguistic elements at levels that are lower than the text itself. We can ask it about words and sentences and semantic roles and all those other things that are parts of language. Where do their meanings come from? And we can have the same three possible answers. The meaning comes from the writer, the meaning comes from the reader, or the meaning comes from the linguistic element itself. But the answer that we decide on here, or the answer that we choose for these elements, doesn't have to be the same answer that we give at text level. We could have different loci of meaning at different levels. So, in particular, we might want to say that low-level linguistic elements have invariant meanings. They could still be uh, homonymously ambiguous, I'll get to that point later, but the meaning essentially comes from the linguistic element. Therefore, they themselves are the locus of their meaning, and it's only at the higher levels, we might argue, the text meaning level, that there's any influence from individual readers or writers. But we could also turn the argument the other way around and get a conclusion that's almost the complete opposite. That is, we could say there are lots of individual effects at lower levels, and we've observed this empirically. Um, my own work with Jane Morris, Morrison Post 2005, in which we looked at individual differences in lexical relations. So we could therefore say, yes, there's lots of individual reader differences at the lower level, but when we get, have the constraints of integrating these lower level elements into a text, there's a kind of dampening effect. Because only a dampening effect like that could explain how it is that we're able to understand one another at all. So in this argument, the effects of the reader or writer are only apparent or are most apparent at the lower levels and certainly much greater at the lower levels than at the text meaning level. That is that the text as a whole, as a locus of meaning, overwhelms the reader as a locus of meaning. Or maybe something else again. I don't want to follow this direction here. I just want to point out that there are many different answers possible and that the nature of the relationship between the locus of text meaning and the locus of meaning at lower levels doesn't follow immediately just from the choice of one of them or the other. Now, my goal in this talk is not to argue for one of these three views over the others. I'll leave that to the philosophers and the literary theorists. Instead, what I want to do is regard each one of them as a view that can be helpful in computational linguistics and natural language processing. Nonetheless, I'll be taking the view in this talk that text is always a locus of meaning, at least for anything that we do in computational <coughs> linguistics, or TSD, in which text and text processing is central. And then the issues are going to be whether we should regard the reader as an additional locus of text meaning, and whether we should regard the writer as an additional locus of text meaning, or maybe both of them.
Now, as I said earlier, computational linguists are not philosophers or literary theorists, and they don't think very much, if they think at all, about these issues. Nonetheless, a view of text meaning is implicit in much of what we do in computational linguistics. And in fact, when we look at this, we find that there have been three eras in computational linguistics. Um, and each era implicitly corresponds to one of the three different views of locus of text meaning. That is, in each of the three eras, we get a different but implicit view of text meaning that was dominant in that time. And surprisingly, the view of text meaning that computational linguistics has has grown to be less sophisticated over time. And that's what I'll now explain. So here then is the history of the philosophy of text meaning in computational linguistics over the last nearly 40 years, divided, as I say, into three eras. Now what I'm going to say about each era will, of course, be a generalization. And it's easy to think of exceptions and counterexamples to what I'm going to say. Nonetheless, I think that the overall trends are clear. So the first era is from the dawn of time in computational linguistics, which is about 1970, until around the mid-1980s, plus or minus. In this era, computational linguistics focused on very simple utterances. So text was usually just nothing more than a single sentence. At most, it was a short paragraph or two of syntactically simple sentences, and they were often on the topic of eating in restaurants for various reasons, mostly concerning the research of Roger Shank. Now, what CL took as its central problem was ambiguity. Uh, computational linguists noted quite correctly that even simple texts, even single sentences, can be massively ambiguous, and so computers have to resolve these ambiguities in order to understand a text. And all texts are enthymematic in the sense that not everything is explicit in the text, so computers have to make lots of inferences in order to understand a text. And CL also observed, again correctly, that the way people seem to do this is to use their immense knowledge of the world and they effortlessly, or seemingly effortlessly, understand texts. So what computational linguistics had to do, the argument was, was to develop methods to represent and deploy this knowledge of the world. The books that were emblematic of this era are these. In 1973, at the start of the era, we had Shank and Colby's Computer Models of Thought and Language, which was probably the first important book on representing and using knowledge in language understanding. It introduced Roger Shank's theory of conceptual dependency as a semantic formalism for representation and reasoning. I notice that title, um, Computer Models of Thought as Well as Language. This was serious artificial intelligence. And in 1984, at the end of the era, John Sower's Conceptual Structures was an important book which took seriously both linguistic and non-linguistic problems in the representation of knowledge, and it introduced his theory of conceptual graphs for representation and meaning. And notice the subtitle on the book there, Information Processing in Mind and Machine, both of them. So the general idea underlying work in this period was that to resolve linguistic ambiguity and enthymemes, you had to find which of the many possible interpretations of the text was the most plausible. And that meant the most consistent with what the system already knew. That is, the input had to be construed in a way that matched the system's prior knowledge. And that, in turn, means that these systems are using the third view of the locus of text meaning, the most sophisticated and postmodern view. Meaning is in the reader. The meaning, the interpretation, depends on what the individual system already knows. Uh, for example, here's a sentence that a lot of people spent a lot of time thinking about back in those days. The city councillors denied the demonstrators a permit because they were communists, and the problem was the Anna for they. Who is it that's the communists, the city councillors, or the demonstrators? The syntactic cues are balanced. In English, this sentence could sort of go either way. Well, if the knowledge base was American, 
it was the demonstrators who were the communists, because in the United States back in those days, it was the 1970s, the time of hippies and the Vietnam War, demonstrators might be communists, but city councilors certainly wouldn't be. On the other hand, if the knowledge base was Italian or Eastern European, then it was the city councillors who were the communists, because that's how things were in the 1970s. And in either case, it's the reader's background knowledge that determines the interpretation of the sentence, and in particular, the anatomy. The second era for text meaning in computational linguistics was roughly the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s. In this era, computational linguistics started to put a greater emphasis on understanding interactive dialogues. Usually they were typed text rather than speech recognition and generation, but there was always the expectation that speech was going to take over in due course, so what people were really doing was um, typewritten models of speech understanding. And there was a lot of interest in linguistic pragmatics, the ways that people, quote, really use language. Because what people say is not what they literally mean. It's full of all kinds of indirection. So there was a lot of interest in computational linguistics, in computer modeling, and <coughs> Gricean theories of language that explained the gap between the speaker's utterance and their so-called real intent. So the goal of computational linguistics in this era was seen as modeling the user who's interacting with the system in order to figure out what it is that they're trying to do, their goals and plans. And from that, they want, we want to figure out the real intent of the user's utterances. Here are two books that are emblematic of this era. The first one is Intentions in Communication, edited by Phil Cohen and friends. And this brought together work by philosophers and work by computational linguists on the problem of defining intention and identifying intention in text. And Sandra Carberry's book, Plan Recognition in Natural Language Dialogue, described an information system that, as its dialogue with the user progressed, it built up a model of what it is that it thinks the user is trying to do so that it can provide responses to the user that are more helpful than it otherwise might have done. So, in this era, the implicit attitude was that a text means whatever its speaker or writer wants it to mean, regardless of its literal meaning. And so this is our second view of the locus of text meaning. Meaning is in the writer or in the speaker. Thus, the overarching problem of computational linguistics in this era was seen to be as developing computer systems that can read the user's mind. Here's a typical example of work from the time. Developing a, a language system for a domestic robot that can understand, and preferably from first principles, please, that when its owner says, I'd like a beer, they aren't simply stating a vague preference about alcoholic beverages. They're asking the robot to actually bring them a beer, and what's more, to do it right away, not later on, or tomorrow, or next week. And that brings us to the contemporary era, from roughly the mid-1990s up to the present. Now, these days, of course, computational linguistics doesn't concentrate on single sentences, nor really on linguistic interaction with the computer. And I say that with all due respect to those of you who are at TSD, because your interest is in the D part, the dialogue. The fact is, rather, computational linguistics these days overwhelmingly concentrates on larger written texts. News articles and blogs are the canonical examples of that. <coughs> and knowledge interpretation and Gricean implicature and modeling for language interpretation have largely dropped out of view. Our methods are now statistical and based on machine learning. So linguistic tasks that were previously thought to involve text meaning like summarization and translation and topic tracking, are now just seen as statistical transformations of text that preserve the meaning of the text itself. And the book that characterizes the present era is one I'm sure most of you are familiar with, Manning and Schutz's Foundations of Statistical Natural Language Processing. And when we develop systems that operate on these large texts, the news wires, the blogs, and the others, 
We regard the texts as objet trouvé, as if they just fall from the sky, or they arrive mysteriously in our email, or they turn up unexplained in our web browser, and their provenance is unknown and unquestioned. And then, once the system has the text, there's no individuation of the reader or the writer. Text is something to be, quote, processed rather than understood, and we, quote, extract the meaning from the text by processing the words. Perhaps we have some regard to their textual context, but there's no regard to knowledge or to broader context or who the writer is or what their purpose was. So the field of computational linguistics has now arrived after many years of research at the first and very simplest view of the locus of text meaning that it's right there in the text itself and nothing else is relevant. And after all, says the comp modern computational linguist, the text is all we have. So how could it be any other way? And well, yeah, if the text is nothing more than an object trouvé, that's true enough. So now we spend our time on systems try that solve problems like these. Find articles on raptor migration in Colorado. That is, search for documents whose words are similar in meaning to other words in the query. Find follow-ups to this news story. That is, classify text into bins according to their coarse-grained meaning or topic. Um, summarize this report. Find sentences in a text that have important meanings. Monitor this chat room. That is, look out for sentences that have dangerous meanings. In all these cases, meaning or interpretation <coughs> depends solely on the text. So we see that in each of these eras, there was a different view of the locus of text meaning. And this corresponds um, to the central idea in each era of what it is that a linguistically competent or linguistically aware computer is supposed to be doing in the first place. So in the first era, getting computers to use language was seen as part of the much broader enterprise of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, in turn, saw as its goal the idea of computers as independent thinking agents that made their own way in the world, so if they're going to do that, well, of course, they need to interpret their inputs <coughs> in the light of their own knowledge and their own raison d'etre. In the second era, we're still sort of doing artificial intelligence, but the computer is not an independent agent anymore. It's now an indentured servant. Its goals are no more and no less than those of their master or mistress. So determining the intent expressed in its inputs is its paramount goal. And lastly, in the present era, third era, we've pretty much left artificial intelligence. Computational linguistics is not part of AI anymore. And our linguistic computer doesn't fetch our beer. Instead, it reads things for us, and then it brings them to our attention if that's appropriate, or it tells us what they're about, or it changes them for us in some way, such as summarizing them or translating them. So of course, for such a system, it's the text that's the locus of meaning. So what we see is that the field of computational linguistics vacillates or slips and slides between the different views of where text meaning arises. But researchers in the field don't seem to notice this, and I don't think they'd care if they did notice. As I said earlier, the field is philosophically naive about the locus of text meaning, and indeed it's philosophically naive about meaning in general. To expand on this point, I first need to define a couple of terms. So I'll call a language system an observer of text if what it's doing is reading some text in order to do something for a user out there. I've called it external text here, uh, meaning it's text from some third party and not something that the user uttered. And this contrasts with a natural language system that's a conversant, that is actively having a dialogue with, it, with its user. Now, of course, we could have both of these rolled together in one system, because the system could be conversing with the user about some external text, which it's the reader of, but that doesn't really add anything here. So now back to my point 
about computational linguistics being philosophically naive with respect to meaning. Present day computational linguistics makes a number of naive assumptions about meaning that I'll want to mention. First, computational linguistics or the system that we, that we build assume that the writer of the text or the user of the system is a perfect language user. That is, we assume that there's little or no linguistic error in the input and any problems that do occur are because of the computer because the computer isn't a perfect language user. Second, if the system is an observer of text, then it's assumed that the user on whose behalf it's working has basically the same knowledge and basically the same agenda as the writer of the text that's being observed, so that if the system can just bring that text to the user, that solves whatever the problem is. The user wants to know what it is that the writer has to say, and nothing more is necessary than the service of just bringing the writer and the reader together in some way. Or, if the system is conversing with the user, then it's assumed that the system itself has essentially the same knowledge as that user, and it's got a complementary agenda. So, the user wants to learn whatever it is that the system is able to teach or the user in the travel domain. The user wants to book a trip that the system is able to book. More generally, it's assumed that the user wants whatever it is that the system has available to give, or to turn it the other way around, that the system can give whatever it is that the user wants, and both the user and the system have the same framework for understanding the domain in which they're working. Next, Computational linguistics assumes that meaning is conveyed solely by positives in the text. That is, meaning arises only in what the text says and not in what it doesn't say. I've got a whole other talk on this point, so I won't really get into this one today. And last, computational linguistics makes no formal distinction between meaning and interpretation. And that's largely, I think, because these days there is no attempt at interpretation at all. Certainly, computational linguistics sees little difference between text meaning and sentence meaning, except perhaps for a little sentence level pragmatics. More water here. So now, with these ideas in mind, we can start to look into the crystal ball and ask the obvious question, what's going to happen in the future with regard to views of text meaning? Now, it's really pretty silly or stupid to try to predict anything in computer science for more than about 12 months ahead, but nonetheless, I'm going to stick my neck out and suggest what we're likely to see in the next few years. First, I think we're going to see some of those naive assumptions that I mentioned gradually disappear. The assumption that the writer and the user have identical agendas will disappear, and so will the conflation of meaning with interpretation as we start to make a distinction between the two. And we'll start to see the in-reader and in-writer views of the locus of text meaning again. So now let me explain in more detail why I think this is the direction we're going. I'll start with this observation. Google has turned us all into researchers. I don't mean the way that everyone in this room obviously is already a researcher, but rather the way that ordinary people are now researchers. Um, ordinary people now turn to Google and the web to answer questions in their daily life that previously they wouldn't have bothered about at all or that they would have turned to other sources for. And usually their starting point is going to be a search engine, sometimes Wikipedia, but usually a search engine. People's questions include things like health matters and hobbies and consumer information and just matters of general curiosity. But when we do this, it's only with a very impoverished view of meaning. And that's because, as we all know, to search for an answer to a question that's in your head, you first have to convert it to some search terms, which are just streams that you give to Google. And somewhere out there, someone has something that they want to say, a meaning in their head. And they've converted that meaning to text, but all that Google can do is treat that text as a set of strings and see if its string matches the query. 
And yes, there's page rank and so on and other smarts in Google, but they're minor effects for this argument. In a few years, I think we'll be matching text meanings directly, for example, through former interling formal interlingual representations, and then our view will be more like this. And there'll be two different ways, I think, that the Googles of the future will help us match up other people's texts. I've called them, what does this mean for me? And what are they trying to say? So I'll take each of these in turn. So starting with the first, what does this mean for me? The goal here is to turn search engines into research intermediaries for the user that look at the world, that is, all the text through which they search from the particular perspective that the user has. To do this, of course, they're going to need to understand that user, their goals, their purpose, their point of view. That is, they're going to need a very serious model of the user and a somewhat different model of the user from the kinds of user model that we've thought about up to now. In the 1980s and 1990s work that I talked about, like Sandra Calvary's, um, the user model is a model of the writer or speaker of the text. Here now, the user model is a model of the reader of the text. Underlying this is this assumption. To answer a user's question, a document does not necessarily have to contain any of the ideas that are in the question at all. And it certainly doesn't have to be intended by its author to answer the user's question. And this is especially so in the case of questions that are not simple factoid questions, but rather are abstract or wide-ranging in the kinds of answers that they admit, or which are just unusual in some way. So this is a refutation of the idea that the text is all we have. We, that is us, the user, and by extension, the computer that's working on our behalf, we also know what it is that we already know. And we know what it is that we're trying to know, our beliefs and our goals. And the system uses this in its interpretations of text for us. This is particularly salient for tasks such as the kind of question answering that I just mentioned question answering that goes well beyond factoids and summarizing multiple documents with a view to answering a particular query of the users. So here are some examples. Um, you could get lucky and find literal answers to these, but the point is that you don't have to be lucky. Find evidence that Norway is capable of developing weapons of mass destruction. Find evidence that society is too tolerant of drunk drivers. Find evidence that the president is doing a great job. And this last one in particular um, really shows how user's perspective matters. Because what counts as a great job to one person could be a clownish mess to another person. And this view is also salient for the task that has recently become known as learning by reading. Uh, learning by reading is in many ways the 1970s and 1980s all over again. Reading a text to add information from that text to an existing knowledge base. But at this time, not just little stories about eating in restaurants, but large, serious, and usually technical documents. Now, the second way that these research intermediaries <coughs> will match texts up for us will be answering the question, what are they trying to say? Where they means the writers of the texts. So here, the search engine interprets the text as best it can from the perspective of the writer and the message that he or she intends for his or her intended audience. The assumption, of course, is that we know, that is, the system knows, something about the writer and or about the context in which the text was found. In other words, doing this is an inherently hermeneutic task, trying to get into the mind of the writer. And the computer helps the user here by becoming the surrogate for the writer. Well, perhaps in more prosaic terms, it's intelligence gathering. In the broadest sense of that term, not necessarily military intelligence, although that's a canonical example, but more broadly, finding out what other people are thinking or doing or planning to do. And indeed, this is the idea that underlies some tasks that computational linguistics has already started on. So sentiment analysis 
has had a meteoric rise in computational linguistics in the last few years because of its enormous, com enormous commercial interest. But it's really only just starting to scratch the surface. More generally, in the future, we'll be seeing a lot more work on the extraction of opinions from text. And not just things like consumers' online reviews of what's good or bad about a digital camera, which is about where we are at the moment, but extracting complex political or other opinions, including analyzing texts from an ideological point of view. So again, this is a refutation of the idea that all we have is the text. We can also know the writer of the text and the context in which that text was produced or found. More examples of this. Learning by reading turns up here too. That's because the task is often couched in terms of modeling a student reading a school text, possibly on a technical subject, and then answering the test questions that come at the end. So the system also has to understand the text from the writer's point of view in order to be able to understand, in, sorry, in order to be able to answer the questions correctly. That is, give the answers that the writer thinks are correct. But that's for the future. Um, Right now, everybody who's talking about learning by reading is developing architectures that take a purely reader-based point of view. And lastly, machine translation. So clearly, producing a faithful translation is by definition an inherently writer-oriented task. As we move from purely statistical machine translation systems to higher quality systems that incorporate knowledge and interlingual representations, just like the old days, the writer-based aspect of machine translation will surely become much more explicit. So we see the roles of the linguistic computer of the future. It's still a servant of the user rather than an independent agent, and it's still a neutral transformer of text, or can be. Those are very useful roles, and they're not going to go away. But in addition, we have new roles for the linguistic computer. The computer will now act as a proxy for the world, interpreting the world and bringing it to the user. And conversely, it will act as a proxy for the user, going out into the world on his or her behalf. In other words, the linguistic computer acts as a kind of mediator between the computer user and the world. It interprets the world to me, it's the user, and it interprets me, the user to the world. In the last few minutes, I'd like to talk briefly about one particular issue in dialogue that arises from some of this. Natural language systems that can recover from errors and misunderstandings. So one objection that we sometimes hear to the whole idea of the reader-based view of the locus of text meaning is that it seems to imply that anything goes. Whatever the reader says about a text means, um, no matter how wacky or off the wall that is, is true by definition. And it can't be disputed, not even by the writer of the text. Well, that's not correct. So even in the reader-based view of the locus of text meaning, readers can be wrong about what a text means. They can misunderstand. So first off, a rather obvious point, but one that often seems to get overlooked, is that the reader doesn't get to say what the text is. The writer does. That is, the text is a given, and the reader doesn't get to change it, or ignore parts of it, or add anything to it. If the reader thinks, for some reason, that the text is other than it really is, for example, by literally misreading or by mishearing the words for whatever reason, and that's a mistake, an error. And it's not just the text that's given, but also the language and the dialect that it's written in, and the rules of processing that they imply. For example, if a text is written in, let's say, British English, and some of the words in that text have different meanings in American English, then an American reader who imposes those American word senses on the text is just wrong. And a fortiori, this applies to gross ambiguities as well. That means things like deciding what pronouns in the text refer to. 
what the general sense of homonymously ambiguous words is, what the phrase attachments are. For example, a reader who thinks in a, some particular text that the word bank means the edge of a river when the writer is using it to mean a financial institution is just wrong. A reader who applies a totally weird anaphor resolution algorithm and gets a different referent for a pronoun than from the writer's intended referent is just wrong. So readers don't have this level of interpretive freedom. But of course, writers make mistakes too. For many reasons, the text might not reflect the writer's actual intent. First, there can be typos and accidental wrong word choices and so on. And secondly, writing is hard. It's easy to accidentally create a poorly formed text that leads the writer, sorry, that leads the reader to an interpretation that's different from what's intended. There can be unintended ambiguities, misleading discourse cues, and so on. Writers can often get it wrong. And that leads us to the following rule. If you're reading or listening to a text and it suddenly stops making sense, you get to a point in the text where what you read or hear is completely unex unexpected or it can't be interpreted at all, then you should hypothesize that there's been some kind of misunderstanding. And it could be right here in the text, or it could be sometime earlier in the text. And it could be your own misunderstanding, or in an interactive dialogue, it could be a misunderstanding by the other participant of something that you've said. In either case, you need to reinterpret or clarify the preceding text. And this is where we see the reader's view and writer's view of text meaning interact with one another, and we see the collaborative negotiation or construction of meaning. So here's an example, and this is real data from an old paper in Sociolinguistics, recording a real conversation. The context is a mother and her son, who's named Russ, and they're discussing an upcoming parent-teacher conference at a school. And the mother says, do you know who's going to that meeting? Now, that's actually a horribly ambiguous, pragmatically ambiguous expression in English. Uh, Russ says, who? Um, so Russ has taken mother's utterance as being what's called a pre-announcement where you ask a question like this because you want to surprise someone. Do you know who's going to that meeting? I bet you'll never guess. And then the other conversant is supposed to say, who? And then you tell them. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't what she meant. Uh, so she says, I don't know. So at this point, mother is kind of confused and, well, Russ is kind of confused either because neither of them quite knows what's going on. Fortunately, Russ kind of figures out and says, oh, and the oh is a sign of reinterpretation. He realizes that mother meant the question as a literal thing. Please tell me who's going to that meeting. And he answers the original question, probably Mrs. McGowan and some of the teachers. Now, what we see then in this example is repair of a misunderstanding. And it's happening at the text meaning level, not at any lower level. It's not just a misunderstood word or a mispassed sentence, but an error of interpretation of the utterance as a whole in its, in its context. And when that happens, mother gets a rather unexpected response from Ross, and he in turn gets an unexpected response from her, and they engage in what is in effect a negotiation of the meaning, a refinement of the meaning of that prior utterance. So, this brings together both a listener-based view and a speaker-based view of the utterance whose meaning is being negotiated. Mother and Russ, of course, swap the roles of speaker and listener as they do this, but not their roles with respect to that of the original utterance. Well, to build, if we want to build computer dialogue systems, they have to be able to do things like this too. Now, but that's hard. In fact, since it'll be a long time before computers are good understanders, however, it's all the more important that they be able to deal with misunderstandings when they occur, and that means both their own misunderstandings and those of the person to whom they're talking. Some years ago, my then student, Susan McCroy, and I did some work on this, and Susan developed a system that used abductive reasoning 
to model the processes in the Mother and Rust dialogue that I just showed you. So to conclude, what I've shown you is the three traditional views of where the meaning of a text arises. The text itself, the writer, or the reader. And I've shown you that over the years, computational linguistics has varied in which of these views it implicitly takes. But most recently, it has largely forgotten the reader and the writer, and instead it's regarded texts as objet trouvé, and hence as the only possible source of meaning. However, I think that new and emerging applications will start to bring the other views back. What's more, I think, or if I at least hope, that the field will grow in its sophistication in its treatment of text meaning. That is, we can look forward to programs that will interact with users in order to elicit knowledge from them, and in doing so, like humans in conversation, that we able to collaboratively construct meaning. And so we can look forward to programs, maybe, that actively deal with the idea of different interpretations of the same text, possibly even finding the common ground between those different interpretations and reconciling them. And that leads us to the final future role of the linguistic computer, an agent that can mediate and reconcile different interpretations of text. And when we've achieved that breakthrough, peace in the Middle East will surely follow. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe all the other weather forecasts are really acceptable. Mathematical texts are accepted. Take the text in, in, in politics, uh, in politics, really. Um, and any political text is useful. And we use some very promising and good So, so uh, I'm not sure if we're agreeing or if you're agreeing or disagreeing with me. So, I'm not suggesting that we always need to engage in these kind of negotiations. I'm, I'm suggesting that that's certainly what happens as soon as we find trouble in a text, that that's what we start to do. But normally, as we read along a text or engage in a conversation, well, there's lots of other things that we're doing, and it's negotiating, perhaps, or constructing meaning in a different way, but it's not engaging in this, I don't want to use the word reflective because it's not necessarily conscious, and not dealing in this problem of actually working through the meaning of a particular sentence the way that speakers do like in the Mother and Rust dialogue. So perhaps what we're getting at, and perhaps this is our negotiation, is that there are different levels and different kinds of negotiation and reconciliation and construction of meaning, and I want to emphasize here, the one about repair of text, simply because that's the one that I've been interested in. If you're suggesting that, well, that describes other kinds of processes in interactive dialogue, or maybe even in reading too, then I don't want to dispute that, but rather just say, well, that's what I wasn't concentrating on today. It seems that, that uh, part of the winning strategy of the current system, what we call naive maybe, uh, is the definition of uh, evaluation tasks 
mm -hmm. that show that the current approach is the best one. So could you comment on what, what other evaluation strategies or evaluation tasks could be uh, those that, that will show that your you know, future, future system will, will appear to be the, the best one? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, it really shows the circle. Our evaluation tasks reflect the same, the same view or meaning, and they've got things like P's and PRF in them and so on. That is, they don't have the user or the reader or the writer in it any more than the view does. So for the kind of future tasks that I mentioned, which are user-oriented, evaluation would have to involve the user as well, and ultimately some kind of user satisfaction. And there are already evaluation methodologies like this. Uh, my student Steve Green about 10 years ago did an evaluation like this in which he compared two different methods of inserting hyper, or converting text to hypertext and inserting links in them. And he evaluated this by giving users the system and the texts and their task was to answer questions using the system in front of them. And the evaluation method was simply whether they succeeded more with one or the other. In this particular case, he was able to show that a user simply succeeded in the tasks they were given better if they were using one system, his, fortunately, rather than the other system, someone else's. And that's a paradigm that we can use for these other things. So now if we have users going out there in the world with their own particular goals, um, we look and see if they succeed in those goals. Since those goals are personal, that might include you know, asking them, um, looking not just whether they get objectively right answers, but asking them whether they're satisfied. Did you really find the text that you were looking for that said that the president is doing a great job? And if we do this for enough people, then you know, they'll say yes or no, and we can compare different systems that way. It will be a user-oriented evaluation. It just has to be. Right. Other questions? No, I have one question. Uh, you have said in the middle of your presentation about the deletion of identical uh, of, uh, texts or identical uh, do you mean uh, uh, do you mean uh, identical text identical or only content identical? I'm, I did You're referring to when I said removing the assumption that user and, and writer or reader and writer have identical agendas. I just, I'm, I meant at the, yes, at the highest level. Um, not necessarily assuming that the two are engaging in the precise same task because this typically leads to situations that work very well when they're in the domain and which are com brittle and completely fall apart when they're not, and that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other question? No other questions? Okay, then uh, thank you very much. Uh,